So uh, first of all, I want to say how honored I am to be here. I'm the last speaker in the last panel, but one, of a very good conference. And I'm particularly honored because I'm seated uh, with five nuns from three different uh, nunneries. So uh, I'm particularly pleased about that. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, the moderator, Geshe Lakdola, for inviting me to this meeting. Uh, and I would also like to thank His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who has in a way deepened my inquiry into the world of emotions in school. At, I'm a sociologist and a sociologist of education, so I'm going to be talking primarily about schools in India. And uh, in 2000, we invited him to the University of Delhi for the first South Asian Conference of Education, where he gave the valedictory address, and he spoke about educating the heart. And that was the first time that I actually heard about how it was possible to build an educational program that focused on uh, the heart and not on the mind alone. Subsequently, of course, there's been so much research on uh, the place of emotions in learning and so on. In this country, we are still somewhat hesitant to offer our children that possibility. I'm afraid that's the reality. Uh, to begin with, I, I would like to begin by saying, what does it mean to be? Not to become through a kind of spiritual striving, but simply to be. In this sense, I would like to talk about the actual self, that is what we are, and then what we seek to construct, what the anthropologist uh, Veena Das calls an adjacent self, which is striving to attain an ideal state. Uh, in other words, it's a striving in which the eventual everyday emerges in relation to a state of nextness to the actual everyday if you know what I mean. The important point really is how to make this aspiration a reality in the present moment. For example, how do I relate to those others who are part of my life and as well as to those others with whom I'm compelled to interact on a regular basis rather than striving to be somewhere else at some other moment of time, but to live in the present. So is it not therefore possible to cultivate morality as a dimension of everyday life, not as some distant goal to which I aspire or to which I work towards. In India, uh, formal schooling and certification have overtaken all other notions of what it means to be educated. We need to question and ask, what does it mean to educate? Is it to learn, to expand one's knowledge base, skill sets, and importantly, emotional terrains? Is it to expand our understanding of learning spaces, to include non-formal spaces in nature, in communities, in families, and in the spaces that children inhabit as part of nomadic communities, for example? So not a fixed classroom <coughs> space. And to understand learning, therefore, we need to really begin with the question, is all learning cognitive in nature? And what other forms of learning are there? I want to begin with this quotation from Krishnamurti, where he talks about education is actually to make you aware of yourself and to make you see other people, to see how other people suffer, to see their misery, their despair. And with his holiness, uh, Given our basic premise that ethical conduct consists in not harming others, it follows that we need to take others' feelings into consideration, and the basis of which is our innate capacity for empathy. These views of education are actually views of human potential, and they help us to understand the relationship between learning and emotions. It's not mere cognitive or learning that will intellectually help us understand our relationship with others, but understanding through emotions as well. Uh, neuroscience, as we well know now, has shown us that reason and emotion go together. We are not detached, disembodied beings. Our rational understanding is deeply affected and located within emotional states. So in a sense, coming to the school space, I want to understand whether teachers in schools in this country 
are aware and sensitive to both aspects of learning to ensure the development of the whole child. Can teachers actually uh, be aware of the range of emotions that a child may be experiencing, different children within the same classroom, and help them to recognize them, watch them at work, and seek to see, uh, address some of the problems that emerge as consequences. Now, there has been a lot of research on, in social and emotional learning, which I'm not going to go into, but that has been one trend which has sought to uh, bring about, uh, in not in this country, more in the United States, a kind of perspective in, within education that informs it from the emotional aspect. Here, they, they have five or six themes, which are how to help children uh, manage themselves, there's an, uh, an aspect of self-building self-awareness so that they make uh, responsible decisions and they have develop relationship skills and social awareness. But I'm not going to spend time on this. What I'm really interested in doing is, while these processes are no doubt important and help children relate to themselves and others, I would like to consider the possibility of developing a moral intelligence in children. Is this possible and what is this? Uh, this, while emotions therefore must be an important part of pedagogy, uh, we need to do, consider the possibility of developing this moral intelligence. Uh, what is moral intelligence? The American psychologist uh, educator Howard Gardner talked about different kinds of human intelligences, which he says are all morally neutral or value free. But he does consider the possibility of a moral intelligence and indicates that an individual acquires characteristics of morality only in a culture where such issues are prominent. That means that there is the importance of education, schooling, a community, the family. The, when the child is encapsulated within that, then the possibility of a moral intelligence is possible. So in a sense, what he's pointing to is the moral domain which lies in a sense of personal agency, the, whereby the individual has a sense of purpose and will in the context of relating to others and to others' life processes. How do we uh, cultivate moral intelligence? There is a sense of innate goodness. We come into this world with a basic goodness. And just as the children learn language through exposure and an enabling environment, it's in the same sense that a compassionate community can encourage children to be good human beings. Uh, building schools then as compassionate communities where teachers and students are co-learners is really part of the process. Uh, here I want to now understand how do we define morality? Taking, we've already talked about the core ideas which we took from Krishnamurti and His Holiness of being interconnected, of sharing a world together, a shared humanity, or as Krishnamurti often said, you are the world, uh, of interdependence, of being in constant relationship with the world. So when that, we understand that as children, the possibility should be there for us to extend the boundaries of ourselves outward towards humanity, especially those others who appear as most different from ourselves. Uh, based on uh, what His Holiness calls in another context, inner resilience uh, in his book, Beyond Religion, that is essential to being related. Through developing empathy, compassion, as a very visceral, emotional, as well as at social political levels, transforming lives in society. So how do we take this into school worlds? Uh, one aspect of taking this into school worlds is the whole process of unlearning. We need to unlearn, go beyond emotional learning, drop false beliefs connected with emotions, such as all people who look different are criminals, or women are inferior, uh, in the United States, for example, of late, there have been some, uh, on the internet at least, uh, you know, videos of hate crimes which have suddenly increased in the, the last one week. And uh, I think it's linked to the emotional baggage that we carry about people. <coughs> Can we unlearn some of that? Can we unlearn uh, fixed identities 
we have been used to looking at certain identities that privilege some of other, over others, such as those of caste, class, and religion. So can we drop religious labeling? We have the view that all Muslims are terrorists, or that in this country, all Christians proselytize. Can we also examine one's own em uh, emotions, <coughs> strident emotions such as fear, jealousy, greed, ambition, and let go of the destructive emotions that disturb our mental health? Is it possible to do this within school? So in a sense, we are really trying to cultivate uh, moral intelligence in school. Now, what does this really mean? What are the core principles? Uh, understanding of learning by doing through experience. Again, this is not something we encourage in our schools. It's present in most schools around the world, but not yet in our schools because we are still geared to the textbook. I, uh, we, I don't have time to interact with the students here, but to what extent can we help children to understand through experience using their uh, practical everyday experience? And linked to this are techniques of bodily discipline. We had this really good talk on yoga yesterday to show us how this is essential also to school education uh, to build this kind of moral intelligence, a conscious self-crafting of dispositions to act in particular ways. This has to be done self-consciously. And here the role of the teacher is actually quite pivotal. Uh, to understand the social world as larger than oneself, one's family, one's religion, one's nation. This is hard, huh? and I'm going to tell you why it's so hard. And also to be able to exercise will and agency in making informed choices and decisions. Uh, so the moral good really can come about through right education. Can we construct the child's moral world by creating an ambience where the nurturance of values and ethical behavior is actually central to the life of the institution, not merely the reproduction of textbook-based knowledge as it is in this country. And right education then is the answer to build moral intelligence by creating an environment where issues relating to uh, social justice, human rights, environment, the moral good, distinguishing between right or wrong are an active part of the process of schooling. So as I said, the teacher's role, like a mother's presence, is pivotal. And her expectations and aspirations are an important part of the child's growth and intelligence. Now I want to give you just one or two examples. Most schools in India build very narrow identities through the morning assemblies that they have. Uh, and it's those activities, uh, those, what happens in the morning assemblies is also reproduced through music, drama, other school activities, which become a space for actually building a local political or nationalist identity. And we seek to, you know, we encourage children to sing songs that valorize certain religious traditions, certain nationalist projects, and the assembly becomes a project for building homogeneity instead of celebrating the diversity and difference that is there in India. Uh, this is true of most schools, even those that seek to be or claim to be secular. Now, no doubt, assemblies are important places for, and they, they celebrate the collective life of an institution. Uh, they are also important spaces for forming identities. And it is important in these spaces, very spaces, to actually build this openness towards other religions, other nationalities. That will go a long way in eliminating the barriers and boundaries that exist in our society. Similarly, I, I argue that teachers' uh, relationships between the teacher and the learner are based on authority, where we punish the child, we judge the child through comparison, through anger, through sarcasm. Can we change this? by unlearning anger and comparison, by building trust, empathy, and friendship, and creating bonds that go beyond a teacher-taught relationship, where teachers are partners with the children. They are not handing down knowledge, but are learning together. In a sense, this will build uh, what we might call the discerning mind. Uh, I, I don't want to spend time on discussing what I mean by that, but really the discerning mind that will know uh, 
that will be a result of all of this, the emotional learning, paying attention to emotional learning, to pay attention to right relationships, to pay attention to the very activities that we take part in or engage in in school processes. And that mind which will actually, uh, these are the different things that will lead to that. Uh, also paying attention to building a deeply affective, affective understanding of what it means to be connected. To build, that is that discerning mind, which rests on my will, my agency, my ability, which my education should prepare me for. To be able to take the decision uh, with, between uh, right and wrong, to look at human justice, to look at inequalities in society and other aspects of social life in a very fragile world in which we live today. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful talk on opening up emotional pathways in education. That in the Yisuna, any kegida, um, Yaragi, the Lopte Nalo Laya, Sanchu, Dandem, be Sherop Siati, any country of Gini, any Gozuni, any top de Yanis, any tea, top de Laneta, top Yashu Doji, and country of Sumis. So you talk about a um, uh, lack of um, moral teachings. Uh, in the schools in, in India, and you talk about the importance of promotion of uh, um, uh, moral intelligence or uh, moral learning. Uh, so, uh, the question is, um, uh, uh, what are the steps that uh, you have taken or you plan to take to promote uh, moral learning or moral intelligence in Indian schools? And um, at the first place, why there's a lacking in moral intelligence in uh, schools in India? Okay, to begin with the last question first, why is it <coughs> lacking? Because we pay too much attention to cognitive learning alone. We focus too much on, uh, on the uh, formal syllabus, on certification. That is given the prime importance. Uh, everybody in, uh, and this is also not just a, a school decision, parents also play a role in this. Parental, what we refer to as aspirational regimes. They desire certain careers for their children. They focus on particular kinds of uh, subjects that are then, uh, you know, reproduced within the schooling system. And the state also has played a role in this because we think it's very important in this country to join the West uh, in their levels of uh, you know, st accomplishment, industrialization, capitalism, all of that. And therefore, it's important to catch up. So we focus so much on disciplines uh, where we think we are going to enable our children to actually uh, reach a higher standard. We don't consider whether it means more consumption and more uh, you know, psychological trauma and all of that. We are not concerned with that. So in a sense, that has been the trajectory of this, uh, especially post-independence, when our Prime Minister, Mr. Nehru, sought to build a modern, independent uh, India that was e equivalent, could be considered equivalent to the West. Uh, that is one feeling that we have, that we pay too much attention to, the, uh, to knowledge in a particular way. And uh, the second problem is some of the steps is something that I was trying to show through this presentation, that we pay attention to the child as a human being as well in the classroom. We don't focus only on filling or cramming the child's head with uh, certain uh, facts and ideas, but we also pay attention, equal attention to the child as a human being and try to develop the child's sensibilities and help the child to look at her own emotions in particular ways. And this depends a lot on the teacher and on the relationship between the teacher and the child. This was something, and how am I involved with this? Well, I have been become involved because of the Emory University's uh, Secular Ethics Program. His Holiness has been 
shaking me to do something about this uh, from K, uh, like from the you know kindergarten, he says, up to K-12. He's very keen to see this in all schools in India, to see the implementation of a program where we actually consider some of these. Now, there are schools in India. Let me also not be neg so negative. There are schools where some of these things are happening. <coughs> But they are called alternative schools. They are not considered mainstream. Their parents think many times before sending their children there. And they are also very consciously aware that when their children come out of those institutions, they are not going to be part of, they may not necessarily be part of the rat race. They may not necessarily uh, seek the goals of success which other children do from other institutions. But the idea is to mainstream the alternative, if you know what I mean. And that is a difficult task. I don't know if it's going to happen very soon. We are st still struggling even with just the curriculum because you don't want to talk down uh, to the teacher. It has to be uh, uh, organically happen. So let's see where that goes. Uh, and Tonanzo Majea, the Karchin Chumbaris Lavimbina, and a Labda Peche, a Muzo, the Karis Lavimbina, and a Rictobia Gitaya Sigunere, a Cherdanke, and it a cognitive Sigdo Kunzuki, and a Samluk Nuzi Tortaya, Dick Chetula, and a Muzo, the Singuio Simdigioris, Simdigio, the young, and a Karchin Chunguioris, Sidu Sambala, and a Gara Gagabdi, and a Nemo, and a Ranzetto, Nimone, Cheche, and Tandabo to Muzo, the Karis Lavimbina. Divu de Yagdu Kariungu Mila Madeba, Anne Nubjo Jagab Soda, Anne Yam to Anne Kyotovia, Nubjo Jagab Soda, Yam to Kyotia, Sidu Sambala, Anne Diko, Anne Mazarin Luki, Anne Tabek Ton, Socha de Ajida, Tia, Anne Zugrunchia, Anne Tajik Nanzuk, Pangme Longju Green Lucy, Sia de Yoja, Tajika, Kari Zugrunchia, the Zugrunchewa, the Peju Mangshu Tanguaki, Anne Lamgajik Tol, Chimba in Bosonza, Anne Pamatsoda, Anne Gigenda, Anne Jagab, the Tama, Anne Lamga de Nijik Tol, Chinche, Anne Tamadilla, Anne Ajig Sanjuda, Sanjuda and Tebiki, Anne Nedung Tola, Anne Tona, Medeva, Anne Dinde Chachimbaris. Ata dig tola ani ma ger ke kharchi ki yes khandi tablam tapshi khandi chhi ki yes labin bina ani ta dinri ko tola ngal lega chhe ani go chuk sam yins che sanchi sanju dante bhi bhi ko tola dia ani thanda emuri da thikana chhi ta kongsa choda dinri ta yama chhe chhe thanda ngal zurimi ki ani shenyo dinzo rimi ki ta karla gor sanju si giro che sa dinzo ki ri dinzo ani labra ka ko nala pel gudu labra ka ko nala pel gor samayimba. Mondone, Cheche, and then Sindra Tuning, Padla, and then Chica, Lobzen Rank, Mold, Lobdich, Tuna Yabudus, Lavanashi, and then Dindig Lobdich, Kilajik, Nalo, and then Tanda Chashi Lindi Nijins. Tiganashi, and then Ko Garag Nangola, and then Sanjuk Tola, and then Lobjun Tedding, and then Sanjula Kachin put Tedding, Labra Chi, Mewa Reves Lana, Mewa Maris, Yoris, Labra Kashis Yoris. In Bina, Labra Denzula and Zukala Gris Labina, alternative Sidu Sambala, and Eco Mixic Labram, Yamana, and a Junde Mahimbeke, and a Labra Dendrik, Mul and Simba Mato, Namguki, and a Shayun Tristiki, and a Labra Dende, Munzichi Yomaris. Just that did take me our sons and Kanginji Carrier Slavian Bena, Pamatu Susu, Pu, the Della Tangu Chigio Maris, Tangu Chel, Kakucha de Yores, Tangazun Lengen, the Carrier Slavian Bena, Junde Mahimbek Labram, Mixic Lobra Denzo. Any Jundi, Yimbek, Mola, Juria, Dilla du Sambala, Tanda Denzuk, Nanglo, Lubu, Lubu, Chedia, Lubu, Chedan Denzu, and a Yondak, Lubu, Nanglo, Lubu, Chia, Yoa, Chow, Tobia D, and a Manzuki, Bezunchi, Yores, then Rushless. This is on Sengari Bagi, and then Mayan Salon Judo Tonate, and a Tonsu Katina Vienas, the Tetandel, and a Tetandel Mikunji, Naka. So I think um, this caution relates to um, the previous uh, uh, caution, and also it's, uh, it's for you, it's for okay, you. Okay. Uh, so uh, I think according to uh, previous presenters, uh, there are uh, some emotions or negative emotions, even though we can change it to some extent for a, a shorter period of time, 
um, there is no way to eliminate them permanently. So what you, what's your take on that? Do you think that uh, these th things can be uh, changed permanently? Uh, and uh, if yes, then how you do that? Uh, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't know about changing emotions, but I do know yeah. that if we work with young children, and uh, because this has been done in other countries, uh, it is possible to build a different atmosphere in the classroom which is non-competitive, non-aggressive to some extent. You can't uh, leave aggression out of very young children, for example. But there is the problem of bullying that we have in schools, so there is, it's not possible to erase it completely. But I do think that it's, I don't believe that uh, negative emotions are uh, unsurpassable. Mm. I think it is possible uh, to change that, but how it happens, uh, <coughs> I think uh, it's better to ask the psychologist. <laughs> And some lots of one in Korea, your remare, Candice Gurgure, Gurta, Candice Tingu, your estate, and so any Mash Rashing Martas, Nijab, your dig Yashing Rest, Chetang and Zuki, Kardu Rest, Labin Bina, and a com Labrik Nalo, Chunjungus, and a chicka, Jonda Tevin Bina, Jonda Tedan Dia, and a Chunjukor and Chica, so the and then Dorchia rank, Chet Migwiki, Lujunte, Maimba. Uh <laughs> So let us, I think, stop here because people with knowledge and wisdom, they will keep on talking for days on end. <laughs> so somebody has to stop it. And I think that physical nourishment is also very much related to health of the mind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Enjoy your lunch.